Right, I think we'll get started. Anyone joining late will just miss my preamble, which won't be the end of the world. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third in our autumn series of enterprise webinars. My name is Esther Carter, and I'm very pleased to be hosting you this morning. And over the coming weeks, we can look forward to lots of other interesting topics um, and discussions on things like how businesses can plan for uncertainty, um, looking at employee ownership trusts and inheritance tax and details obviously are available on our website we'll be sending out invitations to all those sessions in due course we're always open to suggestions and ideas on topics to cover we did a poll a few weeks ago so for any of those that have missed that please do email in any suggestions on topics that you would like um, us to hear to hear about so I'm sure most of you are familiar with who we are. Um, there are lots of um, regular names on the attendee list. Um, however, for those of you that don't know us so well, Morkington Smith is a UK top 15 audit tax and advisory firm. We work with lots of entrepreneurial businesses across all different sectors, as well as not-for-profit organisations and private clients. We're also part of more global, which is an international network with presence in over 100 different countries. So today we're going to be talking about the UK's place in the economy, so hopefully that's what everyone was expecting, if not you're in the wrong place. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by Gregory Purden, who is the Chief Co-Investment Officer at Arbuthnot Latham & Co in London. And Gregory is going to be talking to us about the UK's place on the global stage and summarising the key opportunities and challenges um, that face our economy. I mean really on the heels of our departure from the EU and the COVID crisis, he's going to help us really take stock of where we stand relative to our developed um, market peers and look to shed some light also on the particular sectors um, that he believes could benefit in the medium term. So please join me in welcoming Gregory back to more Kingston Smith. And Gregory, if you want to pop your camera on. A little bit of housekeeping before we start though. Questions, please give us lots of questions. We'll be delighted to answer lots of questions and I'll put those to Gregory after he's done his talk. But please do put them in the Q&A function, not the chat function. Much easier to moderate if they're in the Q&A function. After the webinar, we will be sending around a recording, um, so please do share that with all of your peers and colleagues. And at the end of the webinar, you will be directed to a feedback poll. I promise you it's really short, it's really quick. Please, please fill it in. It's really useful and it really helps us to shape um, our future topics and discussions going forward. So Gregory, um, without further ado, I will hand over to you. Thank you. So can you hear me OK? I can hear you perfectly, Greg. Brilliant. Thank you and a very warm welcome. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, the last time I gave a formal talk, we surveyed all the financial crises of the past 30 years. We began in Japan during the late 1980s at the height of the Asian miracle. We traveled to the Nordics. We witnessed the tequila crisis in Mexico. We touched down in the US just in time for a dose of irrational exuberance during the internet bubble, and then stayed on to watch the carnage of the subprime crisis unfold and the Lehman Brothers collapse. In that talk, I attempted to compare and contrast all the major bouts of volatility before sharing my tongue-in-cheek concluding COVID recommendation that it was just too soon to sell all your shares and cash up to buy that farm in New Zealand. Now, today's talk will be slightly different. There'll be no historical references, and we'll look into the future rather than the past to analyze and discuss something which is much closer to home, nearer to heart, namely the UK's place on the global stage going forward. Now the rules of the road are simple. There'll be no financial jargon, economic formulas, nor political rhetoric. I'll simply share my views on our economic prospects. Just by way of background, I've been managing private client capital since 1997. I've worked at firms such as Oppenheimer and Merrill Lynch, and for the last 10 years, I've served as co-chief investment officer at the private and commercial bank Abothnot Latham in London. Now, just for context, over the past uh, decade, I've led research projects into the commercial property market in Australia, Abenomics in Japan, Subprime in the US, the New Silk Road in China, and more recently, what is quantitative easing and what does it mean for investors around the world? And sadly, I'll admit it did not make the New York bestseller times list, but maybe next time. Right, okay, so how are we gonna begin our talk today? Well, I tell you how we're not gonna start, and that's with a lengthy debate over the pros and cons of Brexit. We all know the arguments, and realistically, it's too soon to judge the long-term impacts. What is clear to me 
is that we traded certainty for optionality. And we won't know whether that choice is successful for years to come. Equally, we will be looking at the UK through the lens of the pandemic. I think we're already all well informed on the knowns and the unknowns on that subject. So before we begin, I think it'd be uh, uh, prudent to set the stage a little bit by establishing what are the global megatrends upon which we are operating. Now, in terms of markets, we live in the age of ultra low interest rates and easy money. And with special thanks to quantitative easing, central bankers have gone from nerds sat at the front of classrooms to rock stars blasted across the cover of newspapers, wielding trillion dollar checkbooks. And the central bankers are not alone. Spending bazookas have been launched by governments around the world, sending debt to GDP ratios sky high. And even the fiscal conservatives in Germany have joined the bandwagon, abandoning their black zero. Now, what is the true objective of this fiscal and monetary combination one-two punch? Well, simply put, it's designed to prevent a mega wave in unemployment, which then causes a spike in defaults, which then can lead to damage and bank balance sheets, which then blocks credit creation. What was one of the main conclusion of our last pieces of thematic research? Well, it was simply a gentle reminder that it's not the central banks which control the printing presses. It's the commercial banks which decide who gets to borrow and how the economy expands. What about the political backdrop? Well, it's characterized by total polarization. Leave, remain, Trump, Biden, vax, don't vax. Why so divided? Well, partly due to the fact that we tend to gravitate towards information which suits us and confirms our views, entrenching our beliefs, so to speak. If you want to learn more about that, I would highly recommend that you watch the Netflix documentary entitled Social Dilemma. And speaking of complicated social fabric, inequality has intensified in developed markets as wealth has grown for some, but living standards have been frozen for others. However, contrast this to the emerging markets where hundreds of millions of people have risen out of poverty. So inequality, the inequality debate is nuanced and geographically dependent. But what's the meta narrative? Well, it's one of course of disruption. Stating the obvious, tech has changed the way we do everything from consuming to forecasting, to analyzing, to investing, to learning, to prescribing, entertaining. We do indeed live in exciting times. So upon this backdrop, what are some of the biggest challenges facing the UK today? And to be precise, I'm referring to the structural problems, which will take time to address. So let's do something slightly different. Why don't you join me and we'll go around the country and survey a few individuals from different walks of life to see what they have to say. And we will start in the north of England by asking an economist, what's holding the UK back? And she might respond with low investment into capital stock, weak labor productivity, not enough R&D relative to our peers on the continent. Now this just highlights one of, the, one of our strengths is also one of our weaknesses. The fact that our labor force is so flexible, in other words, we can hire and fire so easily, has created a disincentive to invest in machines and automation, such as robotics, which means we are less productive. What's the number? Well, we've got approximately 85 industrial robots per 10,000 employees in the UK, which ranks us 22nd globally as of 2019. Right, let's ask a student in Bristol. What's the biggest challenge? And he would probably say housing and our stock of it. Now, we all know it's, most of it's Victorian era. It's lower energy efficiency. There's not enough of it. And much of it is not affordable. Government spending on affordable housing is down relative to 2010 levels. Planning permission is difficult. We all know the story. Can many young people even afford a house without the help of the bank of mum and dad? Something I feel very strongly about in light of the fact that I've got four children. Now, what about efficiency? Environmentalists are banging the table, demanding we switch to heat pumps. What about insulation? And how many of us are familiar with the fact that the Green Homes Grant scheme was scrapped? Add to the problem that according to the ONS, employment in the construction sector has fallen from 2.3 million 
in 2017 to 2.1 million as of end of 2020. What was the big contributor? A circa 40% fall in EU workers. None of this gets solved overnight. How about an investor in Edinburgh? Well, if we ask that question to her, she might say our investable universe. Now, if you wanna buy growth or say you wanna invest in growth or for growth, do you buy the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500? Now, there's a reason why there's record level of foreign private equity bids for British companies. Valuations are low. Why is that? I think it has a lot to do with our dividend obsession. UK PLCs see R&D as a cost, not an investment. And it's a cultural thing which needs to change. How about we ask a scientist in Cambridge? His response might be commercialization. We certainly win a lot of Nobel prizes, but we fail to commercialize, something which James Dyson feels very strongly about. So we focus on academic publication citations, but less on applied research. In those circles, it's called the Valley of Death. Have any of you heard of that? Don't feel so bad if you hadn't, I hadn't either, until I read a very good paper on the subject matter published by King's. Now, a lot of this is due to the fact that historically, the UK government is happy to fund blue sky thinking, but once it becomes applied, it's a no-go, therefore leaving us with thinly funded freestanding research institutions. Finally, let's ask the boss of a London-based think tank. And she might say that one of our greatest challenges is answering the question, who is it that we wanna be on the global stage in this post-Brexit era? What do we wanna stand for? Where do we wanna lead? Or where are we happy to just follow? Now, of course, there are many other challenges shorter term challenges like commodity prices, which have uh, gone very uh, up very strongly, supply chain issues, shipping rates, but the ones I mentioned, I think are top of mind. Right, now, before we turn to the opportunity set, let's take a step back and analyze where we stand relative to our peers on the global stage, because often opportunities are relative. So let's start with hard power. Let me share with you some numbers. So we've got about 145 military bases across 42 countries. We're a permanent veto member of the UN Security Council. We've got an arsenal of approximately 225 nuclear weapons, granting us the ability to strike and defend. And the government intends on fortifying our position by increasing military spending. What's the number? The budget's about 45 billion pounds this year, as compared to 22 billion back in 96, which uh, outpaces the rate of inflation over that period. But perhaps more importantly, where do we stand on the scale of soft power? What's our number? Well, we place second on the Portland Soft Power 30 Index, and we place ninth of 180 on the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index. Let's drill down on soft power for a moment, because it's all about our ability to influence. So when international companies want to go to access rest of world outside of the United States, where do they go? Well, Great Britain. Where do English speakers outside the US turn for news? The New York Times, may you ask? Of course not. It's the BBC, The Economist, and the FT. That gives us voice. Where do sports fanatics turn for excitement? Well, the English Premier League, of course, which is probably the greatest sports franchise after the Olympics. Did you know that it actually generates over 1.3 billion pounds worth of exports for the UK every year? How about financial services? Our brands are strong, our balance sheets are healthy as evidenced by our CET1 ratios. In other words, the amount of money we've got on the side for a rainy day. Um, I attended a fire uh, fireside chat with one of the CEOs of the top three banks uh, only two weeks ago in the Oxford Union. And he said that impairments in 2021 would be better than expected and they think interest rates will finally edge upwards, which would help with their income statements. How about regulation? As a global financial center, our regulator has the power to sanction. And I can assure you that is influential. We set our own interest rates, we manage our own currency, and we sit in the top five when it comes to central banks and monetary authority. Finally, our legal system is robust and recognized and our universities are world-class. And that's not changing. 
So I think it's fair to say that our starting point is strong. Yes, with some headwinds, but strong all the same. Right, so let's turn our attention to the opportunities. And again, canvas a few opinions from those of us from different walks of life around the country. So we'd ask a lawyer in the city of London, she might suggest that London could become the global capital of ESG and sustainability. We're hosting COP26 in only a few weeks. Petrol and diesel cars are off the menu by 2030. Charging stations are popping up left, right, and center. And we are indeed world leaders in offshore wind. What's the number? We're 30% of the global market. We're producing approximately 11 gigabytes today. Uh, sorry, gigawatts today. And we're expected to reach 40 by 2030. The bottom line, we have the opportunity to become the world leading financial, legal, and scientific advisors on decarbonization globally. And that's a big, big opportunity. Ask a, a builder in, in Leeds up north, what are our opportunities? And he'll say, there's a huge opportunity to upgrade, to renovate our stock, change our windows, become much more energy efficient. But the question then becomes, are people motivated? Well, what happened during lockdown? Here are some numbers. 5 million Brits redecorated, 1.5 million built outdoor structures, and over a million built home gyms or extensions. That grossed up to over 110 billion pounds on home improvement, which equated to a 30% rise year on year. So I do think people are indeed motivated. Let's ask a tech investor, and she will bang on about how we've had a tenfold increase in the number of unicorns from eight back in 2010 to 81 in 2020. And the pandemic has only accelerated digitalization. Healthcare, for example, circa 60% of, of over 70s in the UK feel comfortable using devices like iPads, smartphones, and wearables to improve their health. Okay, fine, we don't have any Googles, Apples, or Microsofts, but those, those firms have huge footprints in the UK, employing thousands of citizens, generating income for our tax receipts. So we are indeed getting a form of carry. And digitalization isn't going away anytime soon. Virgin Media, okay, they're talking their own book, is arguing that we can add an additional 232 billion to UK GDP by 2040 via delivery of digital services, richer data sets, and flexible working. Let's stay on that theme. Let's ask the co-founder of a startup, and she will say entrepreneurship is on fire in the UK. 10 years ago, we suffered from what was called tall poppy syndrome, where successful businesses, uh, successful business people were built up and then knocked down. Those days are indeed over. According to PitchBook, UK venture-backed companies saw exits in the first half of 2021 alone of 20 billion pounds. They even say that Silicon Valley is losing some of its gravity as some of the British talent returns home. Don't believe me? Our startup and scale-up sector is valued at 585 billion, twice that of Germany. And the UK was the third destination for venture capital after the US and China. Finally, Let's ask the managing director of a manufacturing company, and he will say the 130 tax deal on CapEx is music to his ears. How do I know? Because I did. And he said he's bringing forward three years of CapEx into two. Okay, fine. It's only from taxable income, but it's better than nothing. So let's change gear slightly and ask, how can the government help? Well, I've read Build Back Better, the plan for growth, and some of the uh, supporting documentation like the Tiger Report, Innovation UK, and the Integrated Review. And the UK government is going to invest in infrastructure, upskilling, and innovation in a big way, or at least it's claiming to. Now, the question is, does the plan marry with some of the key challenges cited in this talk? And on balance, I think it does. And underneath the catchphrases and glossy presentation, there does seem to be a genuine desire to address our weaknesses and leverage our strengths. Take productivity, for example. We need to invest more into R&D, which will spur more automation and tech advancement. 
So public investment into R&D is meant to rise from about 15 billion this year to 22 billion by 24-25. Now total R&D spending by public and private sectors is due to increase from approximately 1.7% now to 2.4%, which is the average amongst industrialized nations by 2027. Now the reality is I can't find anyone credible who thinks that's a bad idea. I also think it's kind of a no-brainer to invest in upskilling. Realistically, we've got too many kids going to university as opposed to vocational training like they do in Switzerland. Yeah, I know vocational training is considered less cool, partly because many of those institutions which offer further as opposed to higher education are underfunded, falling apart, and the tradition in the UK is to attend uni and winding that back is going to be hard. But it appears the government is adamant to do so. Based on the numbers, they're only expected to get back 46p on the pound as it relates to university student loans, which is not a great return. How about net zero? Now I realize it's controversial, but the trend is indeed our friend. Over the past 30 years, GDP has grown by 80%, and our greenhouse gas emissions have declined by approximately 48. Only a decade ago, around 40% of UK electricity came from coal. And by 2019, that figure had dropped to about 2%. And by 2024, the government aims to phase out coal altogether. Now today, for reference, 44% of the UK electricity comes from renewable sources, a figure expected to grow to meet our net zero emissions commitments by 2050. So what do the critics say of Build Back Better? Well, let's ask Peter Mendelssohn, for example. I watched his talk and his main criticism is the plan lacks detail. Okay, fair enough, but don't most get government plans lack detail? I actually don't think that's a good enough criticism. I'd say some more thoughtful criticism would be along the lines of, Okay, infrastructure sounds good, but we are low on construction workers and commodity prices are sky high. How does that reconcile? Or we wanted to go net zero, yet we want to deregulate at the same time. How can those two forces coexist? Or even more practically, do heat pumps really work? I've asked around and I've got conflicting views on the, the matter. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is I think investing in R&D, in life sciences, upgrading our digital infrastructure, supporting apprenticeships and vocational training, it all makes sense to me, but it's all gonna come down to execution. So what we really need is a strong team of deliverologists. So what do I think? Well, I've already made my decision and I voted with my feet. Although I've lost a fair number of friends back to the continent over the course of the past three years, I've decided to stay calm and carry on and continue living and working in the greatest city in the world. And the last time I checked, that was still London. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gregory, and I would totally agree. Yes, London, London all the way, all the way. Um, so we've got time for questions now. We haven't had too many come in, so please get your thinking caps on as to what questions you'd like to ask Gregory. I'm also going to welcome Tim Stovold, Head of Tax, and Paul Samra, our Brexit expert, um, to the panel as well. So if you have any specific tax or Brexit related questions, I'm sure they would be delighted to take them. So I'm gonna kick off with a question for, for Gregory. Um, how important do you think ESG creds are or will become for the valuation of companies and their investability as well? Okay, um, th this is such an important topic and, and it's difficult to cover quickly, but I'll try to just share some bullets on, on the subject matter. I think first and foremost, um, ESG is not going away. It's a mega trend, which is now entrenched and it's only going one direction and that's forward. So to ignore it, I think is, is, is really you know, putting your head in the sand, so to speak. I mean, not accusing you of that, of course, but putting one's head in the sand, which I think is a, is a real no-no. Um, 
corporations around the world uh, are, are, have, have all of a sudden made it a very high priority. So I, I think that's the first thing worth, worth mentioning. Um, there are some challenges. Um, there are uh, uh, accusations of a lot of greenwashing. Um, and I think that's just normal that they're through a transition period that we're gonna see um, some companies be less in, engaged and some companies be more engaged. Realistically, um, if you look at the younger generation, increasingly more and more of the young people want to invest in things like impact investing, want to allocate their capital and their family's capital uh, to solutions which are much more sustainable. And I, I only see that trend intensifying. My, one of my criticisms, um, it's not really a criticism, it's more an observation in terms of this, of this transformation around decarbonization, is I see a lot of investors uh, just very quickly dismissing the energy sector which I actually think is, is a mistake. Um, we had that big debate in our investment committee uh, about a year ago when a lot of investors around the world were signing up uh, and, and basically deciding on an active basis to remove any exposure to, to, to energy uh, from their, uh, to, to old school energy from their portfolios. And, and we made the, the decision actually to continue. Although we did in a parallel uh, basis also launch a sustainable service where clients can invest their money on a, on a sustainable basis, um, we actually think it's probably the best solution is actually to work alongside energy companies um, to help them and get them to buy into the whole decarbonization theme, as opposed to basically creating a, you know, a, 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 a conflictual relationship. Um, and so that's how we decided to proceed with it. And interestingly enough, um, it just happens that energy stocks are actually some of the best performing stocks this year uh, because we've seen an increase in mobility. We've seen more uh, uh, you know, restrictions dry, dry away, mobility go up and of course, uh, more demand for services and products, uh, and of course, shipping, which is a big uh, topic at the minute, Esther. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavor for some mm. of the themes uh, which, are, which, are, which are crossing boardrooms uh, on a daily basis in that regard. And what about sort of, you know, the, the, the layman investor and, and you know, when you're, when you're making your investments in your stocks and shares, I says, you know, you can choose to kind of gear it more towards green stocks. Has there been a, so how much of a trend has there been for that percentage to increase over the years? I, tell you, I mean, I've been doing this job for, for over two decades and I will admit uh, five years ago, I saw there really being no demand from clients. So we, we always ask clients, what is it that you're seeking? And it's really over the course of the past two years, where we started to see clients saying, actually, I'd like part of my, my investment universe being allocated towards uh, ESG, impact investing, sustainability. They see it as basically a trend which is not going away. And that's one of the reasons why we launched a service which could cater to that. Thank you. Right, so we've had a question come in. I think we were fully expecting this one. So if you had a crystal ball, Gregory, where do you think interest rates and inflation are heading? And how much of a problem is that going to be for us if both... Um, go up. Okay, so um, I, I will say this tongue in cheek. I was interviewed uh, by a journalist uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they asked me what my view on what are called the dot plots. And the dot plot is basically what the Federal Reserve, what, when the different members of the Federal Reserve plot in the future, where they think the interest rate environment is going to play out. Mm -hmm. And I jokingly said, um, and we, uh, thankfully the joke didn't go, it went well, it didn't flop. I jokingly said um, that federal, federal officials don't even know what they're gonna be saying three weeks in advance, never mind three years in advance. And thankfully the, 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 the joke went okay. Um, but I will, I will give you a response. Um, uh, Andrew Bailey has, came out recently um, with some, some pretty strong language. Uh, he referenced a hard yards, that was really the, the strap line around uh, some short-term challenges the UK are, are, is, is facing. Um, and he basically said that all the MPC members, so the, 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 the guys and gals on the committee that actually decide uh, the interest rate policy, uh, were prepared to raise rates uh, this side of Christmas, which is very aggressive. Um, in our circles, we refer to that as hawkish policy, as opposed to dovish policy, when actually you want to see interest rates continue to say ultra low, like we're seeing with the ECB and Christine Lagarde on the continent. Um, I do see interest rates starting to inch up in the UK, um, simply because one of the most important things for the Bank of England is that they retain credibility. And if we're in a situation where inflation continues to, to, to pester us and they take no action, what ends up happening is that their ability to offer what's called forward guidance um, diminishes. And that's really a function of their credibility. So the Bank of England actually may be painted into a corner where they have to actually raise rates ever so slightly. Now, 
the, 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 I think the dirty little secret is the reality is if they raise rates from 0.1% to 0.5%, realistically, is that really going to, you know, put sand into the wheels and grind the UK economy to a halt? Of course not. Um, so I, I would also temper, um, I would suggest to temper anyone that's getting too excited about the prospects that, you know, interest rate rises are going to absolutely knock us, you know, knock us down. I, I would I would temper uh, you know, the, the enthusiasm enthusiasm on that. If they went to 3% overnight, I think it would just it would be game over, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> but realistically, if we went from 0.1 to 0.5, um, what the Bank of England would really be seeking to achieve is, is, is making sure that credentials were strong. And that's actually a good thing in the medium term. Because yeah, I think a lot of people, their worry is the impact on the housing market and, and their mortgages. That kind of immediate impact is a real is a real worry. But like you say, if it's going up from 0.1 to 0.5, really, that, that's still pretty low. Mm. So we've had another question come in. You, you mentioned before about the, um, the UK's lack of investment in R&D and its sort of obsession with dividends and viewing R&D as, as a cost line rather than an investment. Um, and, and culturally, that needs to change. What, what is it that other countries are doing right that we're doing wrong? in that respect. Okay, so I, I will absolutely respond. I, the only caveat I would, I would add is that, you know, I, I read a, approximately 1,200 pages worth of research and news articles to prepare um, for, for, for the, the, this talk, which I'm giving to, to, you know, to, to your firm and, and, and to some of our clients around the country. And, and the, the, I think really there's, if you compare the UK to, to countries like Germany and France, there's a real culture of R&D investment is part of the, the DNA, so to speak. And, and, and as I was trying to articulate earlier, where the UK is really light, light years ahead is on the really early stage stuff. So when we're really trying to be you know, deeply, deeply innovative. But for example, if you listen to, and actually I would recommend this, I, I did mention in the talk, but um, James Dyson did a great podcast with an American podcaster called Tim Ferriss, who's actually one of the most popular podcasters in the world. I would strongly recommend listening to James. So just go into Google, type in James Dyson, Tim Ferriss. I'm sure it will be the first thing on, on, on Google. And he talks about why the UK fails to commercialize. Um, and it has a lot to do with you know, where we, and we, we, we focus our bullets. And a lot of our bullets are focused on early stage, but then we actually stop the process and we don't actually follow through. And actually, James Dyson, by the way, I, I've got no relationship with Dave, James Dyson. <laughs> I'm certainly not, um, you know, but I actually, I am quite impressed by, by his career and what he's able to achieve. And he's actually set up um, his own institute to help promote commercialization and, 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 and sponsor um, uh, apprenticeships so that people could uh, you know, join in in terms of uh, uh, making sure that the UK can, can start to, to, to adjust they're, 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 they're where we stand on a commercialization perspective. So I hope that's a, that's a fair uh, a response and also a good recommendation. Strongly recommend, listen to the, the, the James Dyson, Tim Ferriss uh, podcast, about an hour and a half. So hopefully if, if you're a train ride to go somewhere, it, it'll, it'll fill your time. Thank you. So another question come in. Um, the recent suggestion that the UK becomes a high wage economy only really seems to make sense if productivity increases. So is this aspiration realistic or will the UK always need a source of low cost labor? Okay, I, 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 the, the reality is, I don't think anyone knows the, 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 the correct answer to that. Um, my, my personal uh, opinion on that is that it, I did you know, follow a lot of the news flow that came out of the convention over the course of the past you know, couple of days. And, and I, I do sense that there is a, a quite a bit of energy focusing on how we can ensure that uh, uh, you know, different parts of the, the country are, are receiving the message that they wanna hear. Um, and, and so I think that that's, the, that's, that's one of the motivations behind that, 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 that language. I don't know, Paul, if you, if you, if you have a, a, you know, a, a particular you know, um, a thought on that, um, maybe it would be interesting for you to, to chime in on that particular matter. Yeah, I think, I mean, where we, where we come from is um, relative stability to complete loads of opportunities and loads of risk that comes with it. And the uh, challenges for business people um, is knowing which direction uh, to head down. And uh, I think your point about Brexit and how long will it be before we can assess 
the success or otherwise of Brexit, I mean, that's a, that's a challenge in itself to know how far down the road do we then look back and say, yes, you know, we have maxed out on the opportunities um, or whether or not it's, it's been a cul-de-sac and it's actually set people back. Um, so I think I think there's a lot of questions there as to um, and then, the, of course, the knee jerk reaction is short termism is say, actually, it's complete failure and we've got shortages of drivers and we've got shortages of food um, and costs have gone up. Um, but I think, you know, you rely on the UK business economy to be pragmatic and say, well, this is an obstacle, but for every obstacle, there's an opportunity and, and how we work our way around that obstacle is is quite important whether or not um, UK PLC is adept at changing its direction and working its way around um, is is interesting and obviously as you said about digitalization being the key to speeding everything up and getting getting around these obstacles um, which in its uh, in turn requires investment and so it goes around this 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 vicious circle that you need the investment you need the tax uh, incentives to do so you also need the the the, um, the skills and intuition and knowledge um, which money doesn't necessarily buy and you need you need innovators to be able to drive it forward Right. Just just to add to that, in terms of low cost labour, I mean, we're already seeing um, if there are immigration problems and bringing lower cost labour into the UK, we're seeing our clients looking to just offshore whole whole parts of their business. So you don't need to bring the people here anymore. They, they can just move the service or the, um, the, the activity to another place. Um, the ICAW has made a representation to the Chancellor ahead of the autumn statement to say, look, there's a real risk here that in, in closing down immigration routes, or there's actually going to be a flight of tax revenue to other places as, as people just employed elsewhere. So I, 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 I think I would love to see the UK become a high wage um, uh, e e economy, but I think businesses are too nimble. Uh, that won't happen overnight. They'll, they'll move things overseas. And once they move overseas, the chance of them coming back is, is of course, less. Thank you. We've got another question here about, and this I guess is one for you, Gregory and, and Tim. Um, to what extent can the UK benefit from its ability to track business with a lower tax environment by comparison with higher tax jurisdictions in the EU, where previously we would have been um, bound by, by the unfair tax competition rules? Tim, do you want, do you want to start? Uh, so, um, when, when as we've left the EU and we're, we're no longer bound by um, state aid rules, and, and, and one of the things that came out in the, the Brexit agreements is we were going to create a modern subsidy regime um, in order to support the bits of UK economy that need to be supported free from the constraints of what Europe would and wouldn't allow us to do. Um, the, the extent to which that can happen in practice, I think, is far lower because, of course, if we start handing out subsidies left, right and centre, that's got implications for, for, for trade agreements. So I'm not quite sure we're as free to do as much as we, 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 we would perhaps want to, especially around things like R&D tax reliefs, which might help generate a bit more R&D activity. On the corporation tax rate, well, look, we're probably heading in the wrong direction. 19% was a pretty good rate, but we know in, in no time at all it's going up to 25%, although my, my money's on the Chancellor saying in the autumn statement that he might have had second thoughts about that. But um, a 25% rate um, you know, is, is, is reasonably high when compared to other places. I'm, I'm not sure a race to the bottom is one we should should start, but, but certainly the UK should try to make itself attractive for inward investing businesses. That's not just the headline corporation tax rate, but that's everything else, labour laws, um, you know, access to talent, um, you know, infrastructure and transport. So there's a whole package to be done, but in, in my mind, 25% just feels a little high. The, the, the only thing I would add to, to Tim's point is that I did, I, I have in my conversations with some companies, um, asked what what their what their sense was on the whole what do you think about the uk becoming the next you know singapore-esque type and, and and a lot of the the, the executives that I, I i i i mean i didn't poll but it informally asked a lot of them just responded with well it's so unclear whether that would actually happen that we're just not going to plan for that we're just not going to assume that's the case um so i think there's been a little bit of from from business perspective 
in my experience, they've kind of shrugged that off. Like if it happens, great, happy days, but realistically, it's just not the expectation. And I appreciate that's anecdotal, um, but that's a, that, 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 that has been the comment from a number of UK companies with whom I'm quite close and I can ask that question and expect an honest response if you follow me. And Tim, you mentioned um, about race to the bottom, certainly not a race to the bottom with capital gains tax. What's the uh, what, what's your latest prediction on that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is, that is a month's game. Um, go, going up, whether it's going up in about a week or so's time or two weeks time or whether it's going up later, who knows? But um, but yeah, my money's still on it going up um, and, 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 and I, I, not not to align with income tax rates as was the fear, but 20 um, percent probably isn't here for the longer term. <laughs> no, I would uh, I would agree. <laughs> um, I think what, what, last last question before we um, bring this to a close, Gregory. You mentioned that we were ninth on the world power of ease of, ease of doing business. So I was surprised with that. Actually, I thought we might have ranked a bit higher. What what is it we're doing wrong there, and who who is it that's beating us? Oh, I mean, I I I think it's it's countries like Singapore where there's just you know a lot of uh, there's just a lot less regulation. Uh, um, so I no I I think I mean just I mean I read the the business the British Business Council's paper on soft power, and I I, I think we've got great standing. The the, the Business Council's argument um, was actually we, we actually um, have lost ground versus France, and 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 the the I, I did I mean obviously the the talk is designed to not last a lot longer than twenty minutes, so you obviously can't cover everything. But actually the point they made, which was was very interesting, was that actually. Um, it's a slippery slope. Like in, a couple of years ago, the Americans really dominated soft power and they've been on a slow decline due to, uh, well, we all know the reasons. Uh, so there's no point you know, rehashing them. And, and I think the Business Council is just trying to make the case that actually what we don't want to do is we don't want to get onto that slippery slope either. And we really need to work hard to, to, to preserve that place, um, which I actually, in my, my heart of hearts, think we actually can do. Um, but it, it requires concentration and energy and a certain amount of effort. Thank you. Well, I think we could have gone on longer. There are a couple of questions we've answered, but we have reached the witching hour of 10.45. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Gregory, and uh, Paul and Tim as well. Um, please do join us on the 21st of October for our webinar on crisis, what crisis. Um, please do fill in your feedback forms and please do share the recorded material with your peers. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.